What's going on, everybody? Welcome. We are moving through Matthew, as you can see. And just real quick, because there's been just such a demand for an answer, some of you have been wondering, well, where is Pastor Brett Milliken today? <laughs> well, if you didn't know, Pastor Brett is out in, in Athens, Georgia, playing in the University of Georgia's football team alumni game. And so I texted him yesterday. I said, hey, have you vanquished your aging opponents? And I was thrilled to get the report. He did not blow out a single Achilles or tear a single hamstring. And so he's going to return to us intact. Praise God, Melissa. We're all thrilled for that. Scripture reading today is going to be from Matthew chapter 1, 18 through 25. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph... Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. That's the reading of God's holy word today. All his people said, amen. amen. Uh, yeah, one, one day down the street when I was growing up, there went up some brand new duplexes on the street, and some new people moved in. It was a new couple. They were newly married, and they were very kind, and they would invite my sister and me inside for cookies sometimes. And this was during the 80s and 90s, so this was not at all strange or weird in any way. Thank you very much. But anyway, one day we showed up at their door and found they had purchased a baby tiger. Yeah, and it is, if you didn't know this, it is legal to own a tiger in eight states. In the United States, and surprise, surprise, Texas is one of them. <laughs> the tiger cub was super cute. We got a couple of pictures of what it likely looked at. Oh, yeah, there you go, yeah. One more, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yes. Amazing orange with the, you know, the black stripes, the ring tail, all of that. And he was mostly friendly, a little aggressive, but still, he let you pet him and play with him, and that was that. Yeah, the couple, they had big smiles. They were now the cool couple. You know, the neighborhood kids liked them. And the next time we came back, we noticed things were a little different. The couple seemed a little stressed and even more telling than that around the house, All the stuffing from their furniture was now hanging out. The tiger had begun to use his claws and to shred what it could. And this time we were told, you know, be a little careful when you play with the tiger. And then the next time we came back, things were really different. The couple looked overwhelmed. The apartment smelled a whole lot more like cat. Uh, they, They had him on a leash this time. And they told us, you probably shouldn't really go near him or play with him. And that was probably way more wise, but of course, way less fun. And the next time we came back and asked to play with the tiger, it was the last time we ever asked because there was no more tiger. They had given him to a local zoo, they said, and he wouldn't be coming back. They said what had happened. Well, what had happened was they had discovered about the tiger in their home what we will discover about Jesus in this passage, that he was and is unmanageable. Unmanageable. The tiger was unmanageable because that's what Tigers are. Tigers don't get smaller in your life. They just get bigger. They don't stay put where you tell them they roam, where they wish. You can't control them. They are ultimately unmanageable by nature. And this text about the birth of Jesus isn't just like a a trite teaching to give pastors and preachers a nice thing to talk about at Christmas time or even a nice springtime sermon today. No, it's a shot across the bow of history. 
and across every human heart to let you know, like a tiger's growl does, that Jesus cannot be caged, he cannot be corralled, he cannot be put on a leash for display inside your duplex. No, Matthew 1, in other words, shows us who we are dealing with when it comes to the Christian faith, and it's, it's kind of shocking. Matthew 1 shows us we're dealing with a being who is simply unmanageable. Unmanageable in three ways today, as we'll see. He is unmanageable mystery, unmanageable man, and unmanageable Messiah. Mystery man and Messiah. I try to show you what I mean as we move. Jesus is today, number one, first of all, he is unmanageable mystery. Now, here we are in Matthew 1, and what could be called the gospel according to Joseph, where we're introduced to Joseph, Jesus' earthly father. Now, when Joseph and Mary, when they got together, they were betrothed. That meant in that day, more than engaged, but less than fully married. While they're betrothed, Mary came to Joseph and told him, you likely know the story, she was pregnant by God. Now, what would you do if you were in Joseph's shoes? What would you believe? Well, Joseph believes there's only one way to make a baby. And so he plans to divorce her quietly and sort of say to her what the old song said, Mary, let's call the whole thing off. Except he is intercepted by an angel in a dream who says to him, Joseph, son of David, don't fear to take her as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son. In other words, Joseph, your girlfriend really is pregnant by God. What's in her womb, catch this, is divine, but it's also human. It's from the Holy Spirit, but she'll bear a human being, a boy. Now, this is teaching two things which Christians have always claimed about Jesus, the first of which we talk about when we say the Apostles' Creed. It's the virgin birth. Now, lots of folks today want to say, you know, that bit came in later, like Christians just kind of made this up later to justify their faith system. But you can see here, from the beginning, this has always been there. Matthew tells us, he affirms, Jesus was not conceived by Joseph, through Joseph, and in the Old Testament quotation, which Matthew picks up and uses here, the word for virgin, the Hebrew word Alma, only ever, only meant virgin. It never meant something else. See, his conception, this is teaching us, is divine, which points us also to a second simultaneous doctrine, something called the incarnation, the Christian teaching that God became human. Now, right away, we, of course, we, we, we struggle with this. We have challenges with this. And you'll notice Joseph had challenges with this as well. I mean, did you catch the narrative? Again, let me recap. Mary says, Joseph, I'm pregnant by God. Joseph says, sure you are. It's over. He's <laughs> telling you, he wasn't a superstitious simpleton who just believed whatever he was told. No, he wanted to know like we do. How could this happen? What's the science behind it again, Mary? Like, how did it happen exactly? Why? Well, it's because the virgin birth plus the incarnation are all too much. They are an unmanageable mystery for our minds. In the classic children's novel, called Charlotte's Web. Some of you have read this, yes? E.B. White is writing. How many of you have read this, by the way? Okay, very good. First service, people stared at me. I swear it's like, <laughs> Lord have mercy. Pray for them, y'all. <laughs> We're not awake yet. <laughs> Author E.B. White is writing to parents as much as he is to children. Now, if you haven't read it, <laughs> two of you here, everybody at first service again, it's about a spider who can spell. You know, Charlotte, the spelling spider. She befriends Fern, a little girl, and Charlotte writes words in her web to save the life of the pig, Wilbur. Yeah. And in one part, Fern's mother is concerned about her daughter. And so she goes to the doctor to talk about it and says to the doctor, doctor, have you heard what's happening in our barn with that little girl? And the doctor says, yes. Well, do you understand it? Understand what? 
Do you understand how there could be any writing in a spider's web? No, said Dr. Dorian, I don't understand it for that matter. I don't understand how a spider learned to spin a web in the first place. When the words appeared, everyone said that they were a miracle, but nobody pointed out that the web itself is a miracle. But what's miraculous about a spider's web, said Mrs. Arable. I don't see why you say a web is a miracle. It's just a web. To which the doctor replied, ever try to spin one? (laughs) It's a great comeback. He's saying, in other words, the words are a mystery, but so's the web. So's the web. The words are driving you crazy, but why is it this spider's web? Do you really understand how that tiny creature produces and spins silk out of its body and makes a web? I know you know that it does that, but do you know how it does that? You don't. It is its own kind of mystery. You live with one kind of mystery over here. Why can't you live with this kind of mystery over there? See, E.B. White's asking in a book, Why do we, especially modern Western people, why do we scrub away the spiritual? Why do we always move to dismiss mystery? E.B. White's saying, if we do this, we do it at our own parable, our own peril, at peril. And so when Matthew 1, when Matthew 1 tells you here that a baby is the God of the universe, it's telling you like Shakespeare's Hamlet told you that there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamt of in your philosophy. See, if we, if we sterilize this story, if we just scrub the supernatural out of it, we harden our hearts. We stop the blood flow. We become like the character of Camus Mersal in his book, The Stranger, the novel, The Stranger, who said this about himself. He said, catch this, because I longed for eternal life, I went to bed with harlots and drank for nights on end. In the morning, to be sure, my mouth was filled with the taste of the mortal state, but I had soared in bliss. See, he said, what I really longed for was mystery, something beyond me to fill my heart, but I couldn't get it. So I settled for a night of sex and booze. We need unmanageable mystery. We need this eternal life where we'll always settle as something like sex or booze will move to fill the space that only the divine son of God can. Our hearts, our hearts long for this. We long for mystery. We long for wonder. We long for words on a web. And that's what the angel's words to Joseph are. Words on a web written to the human heart. Consider it, God learning to talk. God learning to walk the reality of it breaks the bounds of our minds. And to all that, friends, I say this. I say, thank God. Thank God. Jesus, as the God who became human, is unmanageable mystery. That's, that's number one. But not only that, at the same time, we're told more here by Matthew, not just unmanageable mystery, but also unmanageable man, unmanageable human. Question, let me ask you, have you ever met a child who wasn't first named by his or her parents? Hmm? I know some of you, you're, you're racking your brain right now, you're trying to prove me wrong. I knew that one kid once upon a time back in the first grade, you know, like he picked his own name, maybe later, but not at first. Parents always name their own kids. I mean, Carrie and I have four children and none of them, I can promise you, none of them ever emerged from the womb holding up a birth certificate, <laughs> clutching it in their hand. None of them came pre-named, but Joseph's child did. Because not only does Joseph find out that Mary was right, the child was conceived by the Holy Spirit, but he finds out that the boy he is gonna raise before the kid's ever born is out from his control and beyond his own authority. The angel, again, appeared to him in a dream at the end, said, don't, take, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. She will bear a son, verse 21, and you shall call his name Jesus. 
Now, it was the father's responsibility. It was his right in that culture to name his own son. You can see over kind of a, a parallel uh, description of this over in Luke chapter one, where John the Baptist, father Zachariah, struggles with that own same responsibility. So the angel here, the point is, by coming to Joseph and telling him what to name his own child is letting him know from the beginning the ultimate authority over who he is doesn't belong to you. Joseph, you don't even get to name him. You don't get to decide who he is. He is who he is. He is who he's gonna be when he comes into your life. Do you want him in your life, Joseph? Call him by his name. Honor him for who he is as he is and not just for who you'd like him to be. And this, of course, is always our struggle with Jesus, is it not? It is. Our temptation is always to, like, rename Jesus, to put him on a leash in some, like, room in our heart, the apartment of our life, rather than, rather than allowing him to roam freely in whatever space he chooses. So let me try to apply this real quick. Let me try to give you two ways we tend to reduce the name of Jesus in our culture and rename him today. The first is gonna be a way that many secular, skeptical people do, and the second is a way that many people of faith can sometimes do. First, we try to rename Jesus religiously. Religiously, that is, we, we tend to say Jesus is just one option among many faiths or religions. Uh, all faiths, all religions are essentially the same. You know, Jesus isn't really unique. He's just like super nice and just one of a bunch. But that's the, the point is, if we do this, we're not calling him by his name. Uh, and if we did this, if someone did this to us, we'd feel pretty disrespected, right? Someone calls you by a different name. For example, recently my wife went to the, the doctor's office for a checkup. And she's at the counter there, and the lady behind the counter asked Carrie her last name name. And Carrie told her, the lady looked in her computer and the system couldn't find it, said, I'm not seeing it. So Carrie spelled it for her. S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S. -E -E lady types it in, behind the counter says, ah, I found it. So your name is Stephens, but you say Stevens. <laughs> and Carrie says, well, yes, 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 I do say Stevens, because that's, that's my name. Again, the lady whom she'd never met was letting Carrie know what she thought her name ought to be. But it's the other way around. If you think about it, your name is like the only thing you ever get to pick. <laughs> how you pronounce, it doesn't matter how it's spelled, doesn't matter what it looks like, you tell people what your name is and how it sounds. See, only Carrie's got the right to determine how her name comes across to other people. And in the same way, we don't get to say to Jesus, you say you're really God, but I say you're just really nice, friendly, you know, cheery. Listen, you can reject him, but you don't get to rename him. First, we try to rename him religiously, but also we try to, sometimes we try to rename him politically, politically. Tim Alberta, you may know the name, he's a writer, uh, an author, he's the son of an evangelical pastor, and his career was going well, and then two discouraging things happened to him kind of all at once. First, his father died. Father passed away, and right before his father's passing, he had published an article that was critical of one politician's immoral behavior. Like, surprise, surprise, right? One politician's immoral behavior, and some Christians endorsement of it and acceptance of it. And around the same time, there was a major media figure out there who saw Alberta's article and began not to address the moral dilemma for Christians raised in the article, but to declare Alberta as just being disloyal to that politician. And when Tim arrived at his father's funeral at the very church he had grown up in, instead of, instead of being comforted in his grief over the loss of his father, the people there who had heard the man on the radio, whom they didn't know, criticized Tim, the man they did know, they began to criticize Tim as well, repeatedly, at the funeral, at the wake, at the dinner afterward, they came out, they repeatedly questioned if he was even a Christian, all while his dad was 100 feet away, he said, in a box. And it broke him, and he, and he couldn't understand how all the, the people he had grown up with, all the families that knew him, would do this to him at his own father's funeral. So he began to ask, how could, how can Christians equate the name, 
of Jesus, whom they believe is the divine, eternal Son of God, how can they equate that name with the name of a single human, one-time political party? And he set out to understand it, he researched it, wrote about it, and this is what he said in the end. He said, as a believer in Jesus Christ, and as the son of an evangelical minister, raised in a conservative church, in a conservative community, I had long struggled with how to answer this question, but I discovered there's more than one way to be an idol worshiper. In the Old Testament, you had Moloch, and child sacrifices, but Satan is subtle. We don't have statues now. We have political parties and presidential candidates, but God has his own kingdom. No nation in this world can compare. God has his own power. No amount of political, cultural, or social influence can compare. God has his own glory. No exaltation of earthly beings can compare. These are non-negotiable to the Christian faith. He's saying, listen, no matter how you, no matter how you lean, no matter how you vote, no matter what you think, just remember, Jesus is non-negotiably unmanageable. Republicans, Democrats, independents, whoever, they don't get to name him any more than Joseph did. I mean, if his own dad didn't have the right to put his own name on him, do you, do we, do they, does anyone? No, his name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. And what does Jesus mean? It's the translation of the Hebrew word, name Yeshua, literally meaning God saves. Yah, God, Shua, salvation. God saves, not them or him, or her, or me, or you. No, Jesus is unmanageable mystery and man beyond our control. Now let's put it all together. Put them together. Mystery plus man. You get something altogether new. Third, in the end, he is also unmanageable Messiah. You see this in the angel's last words to Joseph, where, where the stakes Keep getting higher and higher. The angel says, he's conceived by the Holy Spirit. Gulp. He comes pre-named Joseph. Double gulp. And then the angel finishes by saying this, for he will save his people from their sins. Now, in that one little phrase, last phrase, you have everything you need to know, I think, about the Christian faith in seed form and why it's simultaneously offensive and life-changing. Why is it offensive? Two ways. Notice the angel says Jesus will save his people to Joseph, not your people, Joseph, or that people, or even just the Jewish people. This is saying Jesus has a people beyond all categories, beyond all nations, ethnicities, nationalities. He's not just a Jewish tribal religious figure. No, he's a global savior. And second, what did he come to save people from again? Like a lack of education? Hmm? Did he come to save us from a lack of money? Those are all important. No, it says he came to save his people from their sins. And of course, right away, we struggle with this because surely we couldn't be as bad as that. The answer is, if you're asking that, Have you turned on the news lately? If you've seen Tom Cruise in Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds, or you've seen Guy Pearce, Orlando Jones in The Time Machine, you've seen a couple of sci-fi films based on the novels from H.G. Wells. And Wells was a 20th century uh, outspoken atheist and humanist. Uh, Humanist is someone who believes that humans are basically good and we can save the world by being our best selves and best humans, which is, by the way, the literal plot of War of the Worlds. Like the aliens come, they invade, looks like we're losing, but we win because of what's in our blood. Humans being humans saves humans, humanity. So he believed that, and he wrote this in 1937 in A Short History of the World. He puts it like this. Can we doubt that presently our race will more than realize our boldest imaginations, that it will achieve unity and peace, and that our children will live in a world made more splendid and lovely than any palace or garden that we know, going from strength to strength in an ever-widening circle of achievement. In other words, he's saying, it's in our blood to inevitably make a perfect world 
and soon, but just six years later, he had a crisis of humanistic faith. What happened? As my kids say, facts. Facts happen to H.G. Wells, as in the rise of Nazi Germany in World War II happened, and he witnessed the Jewish Holocaust, and he said this. The cold-blooded mass, six years later, the cold-blooded massacres of the defenseless, the return of deliberate and organized torture, mental torment, and fear to a world from which such things had seemed well-nigh banished has come near to breaking my spirit altogether. Homo sapiens, as he has been pleased to call himself, is played out. Listen, the post-World War II pessimistic ish version of Wells has more in common with the Jesus of Matthew 1 than the pre-World War II faith in humanity version of Wells. Why? Because he came face to face with what the angel told Joseph. Humans, being humans, can't save humans. Sure, economic policy matters. Yeah, education matters. Zoning law matters. Tax code matters. It all matters. But Jesus didn't come as God in the flesh to save you through just talking to you, hmm? through just teaching you it was what I mean. As great as his teaching is and as much as his teaching can make you a better human, and here's why I say this, because if you and I, if we could be saved by better teaching, good teaching alone, in a way, Jesus' teaching, it's the worst, it's the worst. It places an unbearable burden on us. As we'll see in a few weeks, we're gonna get to Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount, where he says, if you lust, you've committed adultery. If you hate, it's like you murdered someone. You've gotta love your enemies. You've gotta forgive those who hurt you. You've gotta you know, have a poverty of spirit. Mourn your sin. And by the way, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Who can live all of that? His teaching is not a blessing at that point. No, it feels more like a curse because it just places on me more burdens than I can bear, more teaching and truth than I can attain. If he's only a Jewish teacher, he's terrible. So let me say this, the only way all the miracles make sense, the teaching fits together, the only way his life and his conduct all make sense is if he is what the angel says, God come to save us, an unmanageable Messiah. He's come to save his people from their sins by living the life you should have lived, but you never could by dying the death you should have died, but he did in your place on a Roman cross to defeat sin and death and hell, Satan and the grave and rising three days later to prove it. Do you believe that's who he is, Savior? Do you believe that's who you are, the one in need of saving? You say, I might, I think I do. How does it happen? Where does it begin? Jesus' salvation begins like this. It begins like it began here for Joseph, as in, you just say yes to the name of Jesus. Look at the end. It says, when Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not till she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. Have you called him by his name? Have you woken up from whatever sleep or slumber you're in and called him Jesus? Jesus? Joseph just said yes. He just called him by his name. He didn't try to control him, tame him, put him on a leash. He said yes, and he did it publicly, by the way, in his own way. He took Mary home. He raised Jesus as Jesus, took him into his own home and life as Jesus. And in this way, he identified with Jesus' future shame and suffering. And in a way, he's also identified with Jesus' future glory, just like for all those who call on the name of the Son of God. I remember that I surrendered my life to Jesus. <laughs> Both Matt and Carrie were there. I didn't ask for more information that night. I had a lot. I didn't ask for better teaching that night. I already knew about that. I didn't ask for Jesus to get smaller. No, I prayed, Lord, would you make me new? I need you to save me from my sins. And that's when my life changed. 
The same way yours can too today. Would you take a moment and pray with me as we begin to close? Lord, I come. We come asking for grace and help as we wrestle through the implication of and the meaning of this passage for us today. Lord, help us to do it in honest service and consider deeply what it might mean for us. Lord, we recognize you're an unmanageable being in presence. You've always been that. Forgive us where we try to make you less. And would you meet us today in our place of need and faith. In Jesus' name I pray.